morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, a few announcements this morning, so I'm going to start one minute early. Um, let me begin by saying it's so good to be back with you today. I, I was sorry I had to miss last week. Um, it's been a it's been a crazy couple of weeks. Um, those of you that have heard uh, the day after two weeks ago a sermon on that Monday, I tried to put my eye out. Um, silliest thing, you ever pull vines out of a tree, you know, and sometimes you have to hang on them to get them to break loose. Well, it, it snapped, and the other end of it came right back and hit me an eye. And, uh, it looks a lot better today, but the first week it was pretty bad. At first, I thought I lost my eye. I really did. It didn't hit me that hard. Um, and fortunately, I was able to get in to see him optometrist right away, uh, who cleaned up the best he could, and then sent me to an ophthalmologist the next day to have surgery on my eyeball. Uh, one of the weirdest things, it's not painful, just a weird sensation to have them pull splinters out of your eyeball. Um, it was, it was a, a weird experience. But I want to tell you, um, through it all, I remember the Henry Blackaby study, remember that years ago? The, Experiencing God. One of the things that I took from that is, you know, whenever God upsets your heart, you know, your your routine gets changed on a day to day basis for whatever reason. You need to stop and think about what's going on here. What what is that? What is the Lord doing through all this? What, you know, maybe there's something that I'm supposed to see. They're supposed to take notice of. And throughout the whole thing, uh, two days later, after that, I got a sinus infection. Went and got a couple COVID tests. That's first for me, first experience. Um, didn't have COVID, both negative. But uh, that sinus infections are no fun. And Christy has it now, so that's why she's not here today. So it's been an interesting couple of weeks, but I'm so glad to be here with you today. And so glad to have uh, Pastor Kevin, who on short notice was able and willing, ready to come in and fill in the pulpit. Uh, so thankful that he is here. Amen. Amen. And, and, and ready to that. Um, moving on, uh, next week is leadership, and we are excited to say uh, Rob and Sherry Mathers will be hosting that, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing their, their new additions onto their home and all the improvements that have been made there, so uh, very, very excited about that. Uh, so right after service next week, we'll be going there. If you don't know how to get there, see somebody and get directions. Um, I want to remind you that the annual Shores Fish Fry is coming up next month, May 29th at 2 p.m. There is a uh, sign-up sheet in the back for uh, how many of you think are coming in your party and what you're going to be bringing. We just, you know, we want to make sure that we don't end up with 20 salads and no pies. That would be disaster. <laughs> Nothing that is wrong with you. We need salads. We do. God says we need salads. But, um... We need five. <laughs> so if you would just jot down back there, uh, if you're coming, how many people you think are coming, and what you're uh, going to be bringing. All right. One last thing. So um, this completely is completely my fault. I, I promised you back at Easter time we would do uh, and, and do a big push, and I don't know how, but it got missed. We did not do the Annie Armstrong this year. So, um, there's another one that we don't often advertise, but it is a part of uh, the yearly campaign, and it is the Mother's Day offering, and uh, that's coming up in a couple weeks. So this year they're doing it a little differently, and if I could get, um, Al, if you could hand everybody on this side one, and Bill, if you could hand everybody on this side one, and I've got mine right here. So they've given us a self-addressed envelope, and uh, the Mother's Day offering is always for the Florida Baptist Children's Home. And I was just reading this week of all the work that they do. It's not just the Children's Home, which is a fantastic thing. It's also foster care, uh, Meals on Wheels, all kinds of things that they do through this offering. It's a, a, an awesome campaign that they do, and all the funds for this go to that effort. So the way they're doing it this year is you just send it straight in. You don't put it in an offering plate, you don't give it here to the church, and there's, if you open up a flap, it's got several ways that you can give. 
So uh, I, I encourage you to be a part of that effort in lieu of the Annie Armstrong of this year. All right, that's all I have for announcements. Any other announcements before we have our call to worship? All right, good morning and welcome. And who's doing our
four zero eight. Romans chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse 12, and our goal today is to make it all the way through the end of the chapter, so follow along with me as I read, I'm going to read that whole section. Scripture says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, <clears throat> so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Not as it was by one that sinned, so also is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, 
even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the disobedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where the sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we pray for grace as we move into this next phase of our gathering together today. You have filled our hearts with song, you have redeemed us from our sin, and you have preserved and given us your word. And Father, we are in need of your Spirit's teaching this morning. Help us to understand, help us to grasp, help us to apply the words that you've given us here. And may your Son reign supreme in our hearts and minds this morning as we study together. And we'll be careful to thank you and give you glory for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, on the one hand, um, this passage, um, it, it gets a little complicated. And, I, and it'll lead to other questions that we won't cover today. Um, I will tell you, I, I, I racked my brain the last two weeks on this passage, and, and my brain is hurting. It's been fun, I've learned a lot, um, and maybe it was God's providence that I got sick, because Kevin filling in gave me an extra week to prepare. Uh, I was meeting last night with uh, the Cars and the Tuckers. We had dinner together, and one of the subjects came up. Well, who's preaching tomorrow? And what, are we, what are we talking about? And I started to give a summary of what I was talking about, and I started fluttering around and fumbling around, and I, I got to thinking to myself later, well, maybe the Lord shot to give me another week. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, I read this book this week. Um, it all has to do with this passage. By John Murray, it's called The Imitation of Adam's Sin. It only has 95 pages. I probably spent three or four hours a day for five days reading this book. It's one of those that I had to read the paragraph, reread it, go look up the passage, come back, cross-reference the passage. It, it, it is one of those. Um, this is one of the commentaries that I've been using for our Roman study, one of three. And this is Charles Hodge. Now this book is all about Romans. Covers the whole 16 chapters. Right in the middle here, there is 50 pages on just this section that we just read. So I'm going to try to just go through it and say what it means and not get into too many weeds. Um, but I will tell you there's a lot here. And, and scholars through the years have really dove in here and, 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 and gone deep. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. On the other hand, it is pretty straightforward. It's, it's a comparison. It's a side-by-side -side comparison and analogy given here by Paul. The overarching comparison is that Paul is taking two men, Adam the first man, and the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And he is saying that each man has affected all of humanity through representation. The only two men of their kind A.W. Pink writes this, he talks about the solidarity of these two men and how they've affected humanity, and he, he gives a couple points of similarity. Number one, they both entered the world by direct miracle of God. They both entered the world sinless. 
each have had their bride taken out from them. Eve for Adam and the church for Christ. As a consequence, Adam fell under the curse and Jesus voluntarily bore the curse. And each have had their work imputed to all they represented. And it's this last point that we're going to be primarily focusing on today. The second comparison, and they'll go line by line as you've already heard, will be comparing the individual works of Adam to Christ. And Paul's point is not only to make a comparison, but how to point that the work of Christ is much, much greater by comparison. And you'll see that as we go through it. First Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. First Corinthians 15, 45, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam is made a quickening spirit. So here we go. Verse 12. Wherefore, some of your Bibles say, therefore. When we see that, we always look back to see what connects it. And here we're looking at the fact that In, in Paul's day, the Jews especially would have looked at Paul after saying all this and, and would have asked the question, and maybe you've asked this question in your mind too. I know I have. So, Paul, what you're saying is, so there's this one man in history that comes on the scene, Jesus Christ. And he dies on the cross. And you're telling me, Paul, that his death on the cross is vicarious and represents death to sin for anybody that will accept it. That it represents those and as those by faith that come to him die with him. How does that work? How and why does that work? It's a good question, right? How does that work? Now, we like the fact that it does, and we believe that it does. We take the Bible at face value, and we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Amen? Amen. We're told that, we believe that, and we place our faith in that. The answer for that is in this passage. You heard the refrain, by one man, you'll hear that 11 times in this passage. It is one man, one man, that affects many. It says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered the world. Sin entered the world. Now, it does not say sin began with that. It says sin enters the world, the cosmos, the humanity. Sin was already an operating force in the universe. Satan was the first one to bring sin into being. Recall that Jesus said, 1 John 3, 8, the devil sins from the beginning. He's the father of lies. So Adam learned it. He didn't invent it. It was introduced by that first sinner, Satan, into the garden, first to Eve. The Bible says that she was deceived, fell into sin. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read the account in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It says this, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That was the command. Only one 
one command God gave to Adam. And the temptation was the same temptation that the devil had. Remember the de what the devil's temptation was? I want to be like God. And when Satan brought the, the temptation to Eve, what did he say? Oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to die. In the day you eat of it, you're going to be like God. You're going to be just like God. It's always the temptation. Be independent of God, and yet be like God. Have everything that God has. One by one man, sin entered the world. Sin here is singular. It is the principle, that stained, corrupted, depraved nature of sin. God created Adam and Eve to be a procreating entity. They made the whole race of humanity. We're all here today as being generated by that first union, Adam and Eve. We do not believe, as some, that that was a mystical, somehow, uh, fairy tale beginning of how evil began in the world. No, no, no. We take it literally. There was a real Adam and a real Eve and Paul confirms it here in this passage. It was a literal historic figure named Adam. And he sinned. And when he sinned, yeah, he didn't like it then either. We're going to talk more about that. By one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. We just read it. The consequence for the disobedience was death. Death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. The consequence, the penalty for Adam's sin, passed down to every human being. We all will die. We will all die. Now that death includes all death that we know. Spiritual, physical, eternal. The way you know in Genesis that it's spiritual to begin with is he says the day that you eat it you will what? Surely die. Did he die physically the day that he ate it? Physically, no. He actually lived 175 years. He died spiritually that day. He was separated from the life of God. He no longer had God's eternal life flowing through him. And he passed that down just like when you have a generation that follows, they will have ears and legs and arms just like their parents. They will also have a sin nature, a corrupt nature, a depraved, sinful nature. Now we're going to be talking about a word called solidarity this morning. We have a before I get there, let me read the next part. It says, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, for that all have sinned. <clears throat> this is also singular, and in the Greek it's, it's known as what is, it's, it's what is known as the aorist tense. And what that means is, it happened at a point in a time past, and its effect continues on. So what it's saying there is that all men sinned, singular, in the past. You and I all sinned, singular, in the past. 
What it's saying specifically, the language it's saying there is that you and I sin in Adam. Somehow or another, we were present in Adam. And the death <clears throat> that you and I are penalized with, the reason why we die, the reason why we're condemned by sin, is because we sin in Adam. Now, if you have a hard time with that, and you say, well, I wasn't there. Why am I held to blame for something I didn't do, I didn't choose to do, and I, I didn't decide being there? Well, you and I prove it every day that we did. Because that nature that was passed down from generation to generation is in us today. And there is no way you and I can go a day without sinning. Can't happen. The corrupt nature is there. And we prove that we do it every day even though we weren't there at that time. But God has given Adam representation over the whole human race. The whole human race. Everybody fell in Adam. And the context is going to show that as we go along. <clears throat> Sometimes we in America have a hard time with this thought of solidarity. How can, how can we be held responsible for what somebody else does? But it's all throughout the Bible. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. You remember when uh, the forces under Joshua, they, they, they went against... Um, AI, and they were soundly defeated after the battle of Jericho. And they, they couldn't figure out what happened. Why didn't we have God's blessing? And then they did a little research and they found out some guy named Achan had stolen some stuff from Jericho and he wasn't supposed to. And God not only killed Achan, he killed everybody in Achan's family, and he killed a bunch of troops that tried to take AI. There was solidarity in the fact that he, God poured out his punishment on the whole nation of Israel, especially his family, for the sin of Achan. What about the, when, when God told him to go in and kill all the Canaanites? Are we to believe that every single Canaanite, what about little kids that hadn't really grown up yet and really weren't as perverse as their parents were? No, we're supposed to kill them all. God judged the whole nation by what some in that nation were doing. How about when Abraham was um, bartering with God about whether or not Sodom and Gomorrah should be destroyed? Abraham was like, what if I find five, God? Okay, pre adventure, if you find five, uh, I'll spare them. I know he started with, what, ten work down got down to five. In other words, Abraham was saying, if there's a representative there of good people, will you spare the whole thing because of some good people being there? And here's a really telling one from uh, the New Testament. This is Hebrews 7, 9. It says this, and let me explain it. It says, as I may say, so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes, and I, Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Abraham met him. Now let me explain what he just said there. The writer of Hebrews is making an argument that the priesthood of Jesus through Melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of Levi, back through the Levites, back through Levi, to Moses, to Abraham. Aaron, Aaron, there's the word I was looking for. So what he's saying is that one of the reasons why is because Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek in the loins of his father Abraham. Now how is that possible? Abraham, you know the story, Genesis 15, Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek after the battle that he won to go get his nephew back. <clears throat> Levi wasn't born for a couple hundred years later 
Remember, Levi is one of the twelve sons of Jacob. But this understanding is a Jewish understanding. Levi comes from the loins of Jacob through Isaac through Abraham. So that means he was there. He was present. You understand the thinking? We even have this thinking in the United States. We have representatives that make decisions in Washington that affect us. We voted them to be there and they get to act on our behalf. A lot of times they don't act like we want them to, but they still get to make those decisions, right? So we understand this concept of solidarity, how one person's actions and attitudes can affect others. So we're held responsible for Abraham's sin. And we know this. What about a, a we have babies that die, right? Did that baby make a conscious choice to rebel against the living God? No. Can't even think yet. His brain's not even formed. But he's born in the loins of Adam. Therefore, the penalty is already upon him. This corrupting principles passed down. Ezekiel 18.4, Behold, all souls are mine, and the soul of the Father, so, so also the soul of the Son is mine, and the soul that sins, it shall die. The penalty for sin is death. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, the gift of God's eternal life of Jesus Christ our Lord. The second type of death, we, we talked about spiritual death, and we have physical death. And then the third kind, Revelation 21, is eternal death. Eternal death. All three are a consequence of sin. Some believe that they say that the reason why Jesus had to be born of a virgin is so that his we know that the, the union of a sinful man and a sinful woman produces a sinful human. But the argument is that the union of the Holy Spirit and a, and a sinful woman produced somebody who didn't have a sin nature. Uh, it's a plausible explanation. The Bible doesn't say that explicitly, but it makes sense to me. Because we do know that Jesus had no sin. He was spotless. Perfect. So if you have a problem with uh, that, in, in, I remember in uh, grade school, the, the teacher would always say, you know, like you're doing long division, you check your work by doing it backwards, you multiply it back out, which always seemed like a lot of work. So I would just roll the dice, take my chances, I got it wrong, I got it wrong. But you can do that with math. Well, you can do that here too. How do you know that you're, you're being represented by Adam in your sin? Well, one way is that you voluntarily are represented by Christ in his death. See, we gladly accept that, right? Because it's to our benefit. We like the fact that the Bible says that we, we died and were buried and rose in Christ. We read it in our call to worship this morning. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above so there's a very real way that the Bible explains that we were present in Christ and his death for our resurrection. Yet we have a problem with saying we were present in Adam, even though that's what Paul's saying. And when he goes on to explain it here in verse 13, let me move on, or we'll never get through. Let's see. I spent 20 minutes on one verse. We may not get there. Verse 13, for until the law. Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. We go ahead and read 14 too. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So what is he saying there? So, another way we know that this is true, that our sin is passed down because of Adam's sin, is between Adam and Moses, when the law was given, 
the people die. Yeah. But the only one that had a law up until then was Adam. Don't eat that tree. And immediately after he sinned, God removed them from the garden, took away the tree, and they couldn't even, if they wanted to, commit that sin. So they couldn't, that's what it means, they didn't sin after the similitude of Adam. They didn't do the same sin that Adam did, yet they died. Why? Because they're in the loins of Adam. They've already been punished in Adam for their sin. And again, he's saying the figure of him that is to come is Christ. Again, showing how that one person can have an effect on many. Now let's get to the fun stuff. Starting in verse 15, the comparisons. Let's read it again, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift, where through the offense of one may be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Here Paul's making a comparison of the effectiveness of each one. And he's saying right off the bat, look, the, 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 the comparison of Jesus to Adam, is, they're not alike. They're not, they're not the same. Jesus is, is much better. It says that right in the middle of the verse. Much more. Much more. So here it's talking about the effectiveness. In other words, what he's saying is, when Adam died, we died in Adam and we got condemnation. When Jesus died, it just didn't, it's much more. It didn't just reset the clock. It just didn't, it didn't bring you back to the place where you were. In other words, now you've got a clean slate like Adam, you're on your own, good, good luck. Hopefully you'll be better than Adam. He's saying that he just didn't reset the clock, he did much more. He gave you much more than just a clean slate. He gave you the riches of eternity. 2 Timothy 1.10 said he abolished death. For Christians, we know physical death is still out there. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that it doesn't have a sting anymore. Why? Because it's not the entrance into eternal damnation. Now, it's the entrance into paradise. Life with Jesus. Heaven. It's much better. Right? Much better. I wouldn't want to just reset the clock because I'd be messing up just like Adam did. So the effectiveness is much more. By the way, the converse is not true. Jesus' work abolished death, vanquished it. But Adam's work could never come back and break through on Jesus' work. Once you have died, been buried, and raised with Christ, and you are His, Adam's work no longer ever can break back through on you. Amen? It's done. So its effectiveness is much greater. The second one, verse 16. And not as it was by one that sins, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So here again, Jesus' work is greater. What is he saying? Adam... Adam committed one sin. And that's what we got. Gravity. Whereas Jesus, if one sin caused all this, Jesus now has to take a multitude of sins. 
all the sins of all the people ever committed and paid for all of them. It's much, much greater. The efficacy is greater. says, they which receive abundance of grace, of the gift of righteousness, shall reign in life by one. Reign in life by one. Whereas Adam brought the reign of death, Jesus brings the reign of life. Again, does it just reset? John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it, what? more abundantly. It's transformative. It takes us to a new place. Look over, let me give you a sneak peek, look over at chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. But God be thanked that the, we were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then freed from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. We're now alive spiritually. We reign in this life. We have victory in this life. <clears throat> I missed one, didn't I? Verse 18. Verse 18 sums up what he said so far. It's a great verse. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So the structure of this passage, let me just show you. Um, if you look back at verse 12, He's making a comparison there when he says, wherefore, as by, and some of your translations say, say, wherefore, just as. And if you were going to make a comparison, you would say, just as water is wet, uh, deserts are dry. You see what I'm saying? That's a literary device. When you would say, just as this is this. But in verse 12, he never gets around to saying the this. Well, he says it in verse 18. That's why in a lot of your translations you'll have a bracket at the beginning of verse 13 and another bracket at the end of verse 18 so what they're saying there is Paul starts out to make this comparison and then like Paul often does he kind of gets lost in digression he, he wants to explain stuff as he goes along so now he's coming full circle back to his first original comparison and this is where we have this great verse 18 so the verse 19 kind of repeats it, but then verse 19 talks about the essence, the essence of much more that Christ has done. Let's read that. For as by one man's sin, one, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Ephesians 2 1 says, And ye had, he has quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye will walk according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Adam disobeyed, and he made all his progeny children of disobedience. Christ obeyed. Christ obeyed all the way to the death on the cross. And he made us, as his constitutional righteousness, 
body, lovers of righteousness. I want, I want to be careful the way I say that. He made us to have a love of righteousness. And we will display that by fruit in our life. And not only again, not only did he just reverse what Adam did, he gave us victory and the power to overcome the old nature. We have the ability, as followers of Christ, to not sin. We have the ability to want to please God, to follow the law, to love His law, to love God. No longer a victim. Now we live with purpose. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where the sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Here he talks about the law. He's talking about the Mosaic law. What energizes? What energizes? Gravity and what energizes righteousness. Let me explain. F.F. Bruce said it this way. The law has no permanent significance in the history of redemption. I like that saying. The law, let me repeat that, the law has no permanent significance in the history of redemption. It's a corollary. It's a corollary. What does it mean? And it says it right here in our verse. You would expect it to say... Moreover, the law entered that the offense might slow down. Or moreover, the law entered that the offense might be less. That's not what it says, though, is it? What does it say? Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. How's that? Well, a couple different ways. Number one, you know, you can... There's, there's a saying that us rednecks like to have. You can claim ignorance. But once you know better, you can't claim ignorance anymore, right? So, when you know better, you know it's wrong. So when the law puts a spotlight on what you're not to do, it, it, it brings it out. It, it makes it shine. You know better than that, my mom used to tell me. You know better than that. Another way it does it is is it actually works within our disobedient nature that we got from Adam. Picture this, you know, a kid's walking along the street, he looks over and sees this sign and says, don't pick the flowers. The kid wasn't even thinking about picking the flowers before then, right? But now his depraved nature is working in him, and he's like... <laughs> right? Just tell him not to. Put that... Put that open plate of cookies on the table and, and then say, don't, those are for later, don't touch them. And then you go outside, come back and see if there's not one missing. Right? So the law works in us to heighten sin. Not only points it out, heightens it. But then the adverse is also true. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Love the hymn, Grace That Is Greater Than All My Sin. I love that line. The law now has a different relationship to me as a Christian. No longer do I, you know, kind of grind under the law. I love the law. It's, it's from God. It's holy. It's perfect. How can it be wrong? How can it be bad? We love to please the Lord. If I know what to do, it's like your, your mom, you know, if, if you knew what would please your mom, you could, right? Just to make her happy. So we know what makes the Lord happy. We obey the law. We want to. We have a different relationship to the law now. And then verse 21. 
that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul now goes full circle. He has dropped Adam's... Uh, he's not even making the comparison to Adam anymore. He's not making it to a person. He's, he's just using the, the idea because now he wants to move on to his true focus, which has been his focus all along. And that's the reign of righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now he's referenced, we pointed it out several times in chapter 5. He's referenced Jesus, we could go through and count it again, something like 24 times in this chapter. It's been his focus. He wants us to focus on Jesus Christ. But this is the first time he calls him at the end, Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord. Because He reigns. He reigns in us. It's a new idea for Christians. No longer am I the servant and slave of sin. That was the king over my life. That was the one who reigned and was sovereign over my life as a lost person. Now Jesus is the Lord over my life. He reigns. So he's returning back to the focus. So a couple questions here. Number one, why did God do it this way? Why did God make Adam to represent all of us and then Jesus to represent all of us? Why did he do it that way? Well, one thing that I thought about is, um, I thought about angels this week. And we, we mentioned it back at the very beginning. When Satan sinned, and those that fell with him sinned, those were individually created beings. They didn't procreate. God made a limited number of angels, and that's all that was made when he made them. And those that decided to fall, fell, and there is no redemption for angels. As a matter of fact, hell, as we're told in Matthew 25, hell was created for the devil and his angels. But when we fell in Adam... God had to have a punishment for us. That's why we go to hell too. That wasn't the primary reason it was made. But God made us to procreate. Now he could have said, when Adam and Eve sinned, he could have in his holiness, and in his righteousness, and in his justice, said, ah, okay. Tried that, didn't work, do it over. And just annihilated them. He had every right as a holy and just God to do that. Amen? But he showed us something different. Something that the angels never saw. Something the angels don't even understand. He immediately, instead of annihilating them, killed an animal and put their skins on them and covered them in the skins and pointed to something that he was going to do on their behalf that would take care of that. Adam and Eve were saved. We're going to see Adam and Eve again. They are redeemed. They were lost for you know, however long there, a few minutes. They immediately remembered back to what they lost. By the way, they didn't get what they wanted, did they? Satan promised them something and Sin never gives us what we want. So instead, he shows them mercy and grace. First Peter 1.12 says, The angels have a great desire to look into this thing that God is doing with humans. And in Ephesians 3, 9 and 10, God says that in eternity... So right now, angels, it's God, then angels, and then humans in the order of existence, in the order of creation, and then the animals and plants and everything. In eternity, we're going to switch places with the angels. It's going to be God, humans, and then the angels. The angels will be servants of the redeemed in eternity. 
And Ephesians 9 and 10 says, part of the mystery of what God has done through the cross in Jesus Christ is that throughout all eternity, we're going to be an object lesson to another side to the angels they've never seen before, don't understand. See, the angels understand the sovereignty of God, the majesty of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God. They got no problem with that. They rejoice and they worship in that all day long. The, the holy angels that are still there. Now, we on the other hand, we understand grace and mercy and forgiveness. They have never experienced that. They're looking at it and watching this all play out firsthand. And they're going, wow, that is cool stuff. Ephesians 9 and 10 says that in eternity, we're going to be object lessons for them. For grace and mercy and love and compassion. And we also get to see, now would God have done something that wasn't for His glory and our benefit? So this, there's the reason why God brought all this to pass. Would you have done it differently? Would I have done it differently? No, we would have messed it up. So I would anyway. God's got a good purpose. He's got a great purpose. How did we die in Christ? What does that look like? I'm glad you asked. Come back next week. <laughs> because next week we're going to be talking about the practical outworking. Paul has been giving us theology now for five chapters. Next week he's going to start to talk about what this means in your life. What should it look like in your life? And he's going to tell us what the death of Christ should look like in our life. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful for the gift of your word. I, I we made it through it this morning. And, and, and you are great enough to be able to take your words and apply them to our hearts and teach us in humility whatever you want us to know. So, Father, I... I struggle for ways to explain complicated things. I pray that it was a benefit this morning to be able to read this passage. Uh, the greatest thing that we got out of it this morning, that I got out of it this morning, is that Christ is better. Christ is better than everything that was done to make things bad was made better and a and hundred times better by what you did through Christ. And we're so thankful. We're thankful that regardless of why you chose to have the, the human race fall, you chose something much greater, and that's that you chose to save us and love us and give us the opportunity to be redeemed. Never again to go back to that place. And this morning, Lord, we are eternally grateful for that. And we see that working out through your Son. And that is our focus this morning, and that is our, our praise this morning. And we just want to end with that this morning, Lord, to say thank you for saving our souls. Thank you for delivering us from the power of sin. And thank you for the promise of what's in store for us uh, after this life. Pray that anybody here today that's still struggling with that decision doesn't understand the consequences of everything that you've laid out for us this morning, that today they'll make that decision. Come to Christ. Have their sins forgiven. Start a new life. Start an eternal life. Eternity starts the moment that we accept Christ. We praise you for what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to respond today to anything that we've talked about, we invite you to come as we stand together and sing.